The primary goal of, of the uh, Geothermal Resources Council is education. We run workshops uh, on particular technical issues of geothermal development. We have an annual meeting in which most of the geothermal people within the US and indeed from overseas as well will come uh, uh, present papers and, and, and share technologies that have been developed. So it's uh, it's, it's primary and educational purpose, uh, uh, and that's, that's what we do. Geothermal energy is use of the natural heat that we, we, we have within the Earth's crust. It's broken down by geo, which is earth, and thermal force is heat, so we, we extract heat from the earth. You could be in volcanic areas or non-volcanic areas, you could be in sedimentary basins. Where the heat is close enough to the surface, we can access it and use that heat uh, either in the form of, of hot water and steam or the actual heat of the rocks to be able to generate electricity. So what we do is we drill down into that rock and then start extracting that water, remove the heat from the water, make electricity, and then put that water back in. And it circulates along in the rock and reheats, and then we start to cycle all over again. So it's very sustainable. We're not pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We're not pumping soot into the atmosphere. We're not putting out radioactive waste or any of the byproducts we have from conventional non-renewable energy sources. You don't have to worry about cloudy days or days with no wind or a storm tearing up your windmill or anything like that. Geothermal is unique in that it's baseload. If you, if you build a coal plant, it runs around the clock, 24 hours a day, stay. A new plant does the same thing. A natural gas plant does the same. Solar, of course, runs when the sun shines. Wind turbines you know, turn when the wind blows. So they're what we classify as intermittents. And what, what happens is when you, when you bring a lot of intermittent loads, and we all like wind, we all like solar. They're a piece of the puzzle. Uh, but when you bring a lot of them into the grid, you, you create uh, issues with grid stability. Geothermal doesn't come with any of those hidden costs. It's steady. It's the only baseload renewable out there. I think the problem with geothermal is that it's, it takes quite a long time to develop a project. And so, and, and projects are more complicated in their setting. Whereas uh, solar and, and wind 
they're very easy to, to visualize, and uh, it's easier to, to estimate the ultimate cost. Whereas geothermal, we still have problems with, uh, how, you know, sometimes the resource is not what we think it is, sometimes it costs more. It takes a lot of technical work to be able to determine where that heat is. It's mostly the difficulties finding where the best places are, unless there's something like a geyser or a hot spring. Wind and solar are difficult to integrate into the grid because they're unpredictable. And I think geothermal has been placed in that same category, despite the fact that it's very predictable and controllable. It's, it's a harder to sell than things like solar and wind, um, because there's very, it's, those are in, in a matter of very simplistic forms of energy. Uh, any, anybody can understand the concept of a wind turbine. I think geothermal is just harder for people to imagine. It's not something that you can see above ground, you know, it's not something that is, it's as visible, therefore as noticeable as something like a giant wind turbine or solar panels. It's, um, it, it's basically a public outreach problem. I think because most people don't really understand what it is, if you ask the average person, they get concerned that there's some sort of huge volcano below their feet that's going to erupt. Uh, so I think it's uh, I think it's just that it's a message issue. In the 1990s, I think it was when we had the first or the the, la the latest big oil crisis, solar and wind got a lot of traction because it's very visible. I think people overcomplicate it a lot of the time. I mean, it's it is complicated, and there are certainly intricacies and, and a lot of science involved. And and um, but I, I think. Because people can't see it directly, um, they, they they feel like they could never understand it. And so it's really quite obvious that the geothermal industry has struggled for many years in terms of its recognition. President Obama said geothermal actually said all four syllables. That was very exciting for our industry because there's no geothermal out there in the east where a lot of people are. A lot of the resources that we think about today are located in the western United States, and so people out east don't necessarily see that? So it's a western kind of thing and we're a small industry uh, but a very important industry and provide a, a great service but uh, if I ask my, uh, my brother who lives back east what geothermal is he may not be able to explain those four syllables to you as well as I can in the west. Wind is something that you can feel so the, the heat of the, the, of the sun is something you can see and feel but geothermal occurs beneath the surface of the ground and that's not readily uh, detectable uh, during your everyday life. The public misconception of what is what is geothermal? I mean, there's there's electricity generation, there's direct use, which is heating, cooling, aquaculture, uh, all sorts of, uh, of applications. But then most people see geothermal as, as ground source heat pumps. So in Canada, where I'm from, uh, whenever I tell somebody that I'm involved with, uh, with geothermal research, immediately that is that's the assumption. Which is fine, but I think it's a marketing problem with our industry. What we need to develop in geothermal is a cookie cutter model for geothermal like they have for solar and wind. And that's what we have not done yet, but that's what we have to do to really make geothermal a big part of the nation's energy. We have a few setbacks. Perhaps our, our biggest setback is the cost, the upfront cost, capital cost for developing geothermal systems. Well, you know, one of the barriers is it is fairly expensive. The capital costs are, you know, four thousand dollars a kilowatt, roughly. So they're almost approaching the capital cost of a nuclear power plant. Very high startup costs because of the drilling involved and the higher risk. It doesn't take a lot of money to find out where it's sunny or where it's windy. It takes a lot of money to find out where the hot water is two miles underground. So while once we drilled a well, we have a resource for a long period of time, you have to have the money to be able to, uh, the upfront capital to be able to drill those wells. And perhaps the biggest uh, development that we've seen so far in the last few years is research going on to be able to, we call it the research EGS, stands for Enhanced Geothermal Systems. Uh, well, enhanced geothermals, you know, a way to improve the economics. 
So there's been a lot of work um, in enhanced geothermal systems, which some may say is the future of geothermal, and that's this idea that we can create a geothermal reservoir in hot dry rock. Uh, it's, it's a technology that allows us not to have to find hot water and steam in the ground, but we could use just the natural rock heat. Uh, it's taking some time to, to develop, but that's moving along, and we're hopeful that this could be a huge development in the, within the next 10 years or so. The big thing we have to do is to uh, follow the EGS track and to find ways to uh, get water into hot rock and circulate it and get, uh, get produce power that way. And another big source of energy would be to <coughs> convert old oil and gas wells, particularly in, in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, which produce lots of flow that's warm into geothermal producers. And there are just a few examples of that now where we're producing power from oil and gas wells, but there should be many, many more if we could ever get over the hurdle and get people to accept the concept and, and, and develop projects. Well, the future of geothermal energy is tied to, to energy prices and energy policy, like so many different things. And the problem with uh, geothermal energy is that our energy policy and prices have, have go up and down. And, and geothermal has a fairly long development. An individual project has a fairly long development time. And unfortunately, when the price goes up, we start the development, the price goes down, people give up, then the price goes up again, we start again. And so the, the, it's the, really the, the development cycle of geothermal that's part of the problem. I think geothermal energy has a great future. We're seeing more funding from Congress. Um, historically, this year has been the highest Department of Energy uh, budget for geothermal energy in 30, 40 years. I think geothermal has a really, really promising future. There's a lot of incentive for people to do good research and um, and to really push geothermal forward and, and make it more of a, a global player. And I think people just have to start thinking globally. I mean, if you if you look at East Africa, if you look at Central America, um, these emerging markets are, are very receptive to geothermal, and they see it. They've seen it work at small smaller projects, localized projects, but the untapped potential is, is giant. I think we should exploit all non-carbon uh, energy resources in the U.S. Well, I see a, a very uh, healthy future for geothermal energy. The renewable energy industry has its ups and downs. I, I, I see a long-term future for geothermal because when we see a lot of intermittent uh, renewable energies like wind and, uh, and solar, that causes some problems in terms of the, the transmission system and the grid system. The one positive thing about uh, geothermal energy it, that is a base load. That means it, it once you've developed a geothermal system, it, it, it goes on for pretty much 24 hours a day. If we could make plans, we could plan for the future and continue work through the down cycles and the up cycles, then we could end up eventually in the right position at the right time. So if we could get the public outreach out there and make people understand that this is good, this is safe, we all want clean air, we all want clean water. Hopefully it would be headed towards a more commonplace form of energy in the United States. But I feel like to do that, the United States needs to take cues from Iceland and New Zealand and actually say, this is what we're doing. We're making geothermal part of our culture and we're funding it. So deal with it. I've been working in geothermal for a long time and it's, I'm, I'm sort of discouraged that we haven't done better than we have done. I still think that we can if the, if the situation is right. And I'm also glad to see that we have a lot of students getting involved because it's important to have a, a, a program and an industry, and hopefully we'll have jobs for all the students. My name is David Blackwell, and I'm retired from Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. My name is Paul Brophy. Uh, my company is called EGS Inc. Uh, uh, and I'm also the president or president-elect of the Geothermal Resources Council. 
I'm Bob Sullivan. I'm the Senior Vice President for Ormet Technologies. My name is Tom Edmonds. I work for Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. And I'm the uh, Associate Program Leader for Energy Systems. My name is Anna Kroll. I'm an instructor at the University of North Dakota. I'm a graduate student. I'm Josh Kroll. I'm a graduate student working at my PhD at the University of North Dakota. Ryan Libby. I am a PhD student at McGill University. Uh, my name is Faye Ricker. I am a master's student at the University of North Dakota. Uh, my name is Laura Garcher. I am a science and technology policy fellow at the GFM Technologies Office, which is part of the U.S. Department of Education. I'm Caitlin Hardig. I am a master's student at University of North Dakota, studying with Will Gosmold, um, geothermal energy. Well, I'm a geologist by profession. Uh, I've been a geologist for nearly 40 years in the geothermal industry. Uh, and uh, what we do in the industry is really explore for the geothermal resources uh, uh, by, by various techniques uh, uh, to locate their position so we can drill and access it. Ormat is the world leading developer of geothermal uh, worldwide. We manufacture and design the facilities we operate and we also sell them to uh, other uh, developers. We, we operate uh, in many places and we've sold uh, power plants in over 70 countries in the world and we, we own and operate over 600 megawatts of service. Um, well, we've been doing simulation models of the Western Power Grid, and we recently did a study looking at integration of uh, solar and wind technologies into the Western Grid. And we're now looking at uh, geothermal energy as a way to moderate some of the uncertainty and uh, variability associated with intermittent heat. I started working on a PhD in 1963, and I started making heat flow measurements in 1963. In 1966, I discovered a geothermal system, which nobody knew about, and, and everybody said I'd made the wrong measurement, and I'm stubborn. And so, so I tried to follow up on it, and it ended up in a big geothermal project, and I got into geothermal energy in that one. <laughs>